Look at her, just chatted the whole time. Yeah, she's always got lots of stories. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really interesting ones as well. Mm. Um, two sex. <laughs> Okay, let's get <laughs> let's get started. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here for our oh, 100, the 100th person just joined us for our um, the archaeology seminar for this afternoon. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce a series of very talented colleagues who are working on a, a fantastic project that's a, it's a relatively early stages, but has got huge potential to become something really exciting. So the, the team are going to be talking about, um, and I'm afraid I can't pronounce it <laughs> in common, but um, I'm sure that's not exactly how it's pronounced, but uh, Glenn quote, landscape and performance in a digital data. So what I'm going to do is I'll introduce each of the speakers in turn. We've got six different presenters and, um, and then they can give their presentation. And I think if that's okay, we'll save questions to the end just to kind of keep the flow of things. Uh, so during the, the talk, if people could keep their microphone muted, please, to avoid any weird background noises. And obviously, feel free to use the chat function as we go along um, to put your marker down for questions. And once everyone's spoken, then we can hopefully have a bit of discussion at the end with a sort of a virtual panel of the, the six speakers about the project. So our first speaker uh, this, this afternoon uh, is Michael Gibbon, who's a senior lecturer in archaeology here at the University of Glasgow. And Michael has got a particular interest in landscape archaeology. And um, I'll hand over to Michael to get the ball rolling. Okay, uh, Kenny, I wonder if it would actually be slicker if you just introduce all six of us at once, because we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just hand over straight from one to the next. That's fine. Okay, that's okay. great. So our second speaker will be Megan Caston, who's a um, teaching assistant. Yes, wave. That's great. Yeah, in archaeology and Celtic here at the university and uh, was research assistant for the Digital Glens project last summer. Third up will be Eddie Stewart, who is doing a PhD in archaeology at University of Glasgow, and his research primarily centres on investigating transhumans landscapes in post-medieval Scotland, and not prehistory, as I tried to persuade him to be interested in for many years. <laughs> oh well. Lizzie Robertson's also a first-year PhD student at Glasgow with a background in archaeology and digital documentation, in particular, and her research interests include using creativity and sound and heritage interpretation. And Lizzie's been doing some um, great stuff in relation to a rock art project we've been working on. Um, so I'm excited to see what she's going to present today, but it won't be about rock art, I guess. Um, I just try and shoehorn prehistory into everything, as you can see. Uh, Kate Langhorn is a, a recent graduate of the University of Glasgow in an in interdisciplinary master's programme, the MSc in Ancestral Studies, which is based in archaeology. And she works primarily through the medium of Scottish Gaelic and uses a variety of creative media to interpret and revitalise elements of Gaelic cultural heritage in different localities across the... Oh, no. The <laughs> you to turn yourself okay. Thank you. Sorry, this is embarrassing. <laughs> and then our final speaker um, wrapping things up today will be Gareth Beale, who's a lecturer in digital archaeology here at the university, and he's going to talk today about his practice-based research with experimental film making. So a fantastic team, and I'll now hand you over to Michael to get things started. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Hello, hello, Dinius. Falch a good glown digital hacky. Ja acha mirvloch a hound and glown shaw. A duch a sound, a echtri own, a natter, skeeloch the air kyol, a hulurut and shaw. So welcome everyone to our digital Glen. It's a fantastic place to be. It's full of history and heritage and memory and story and music and drama, all of these different things. And, and we're really pleased that you're here with us. Um, and we are all tonight the inhabitants of this digital Glen. Uh, so um, we are six people with um, lots of common interests and very different perspectives, uh, as you will find out. At the base of this, there is the, um, the early stages of a project called uh, uh, Digital Glens. Um, um, and that is being developed by Gareth and me and Anus Mechonic and Guy Schofield. And we're very grateful to them for all of their input. Uh, last summer, um, thanks to funding from the Centre for Scottish and Celtic Studies, Megan Caston, who you'll be hearing from shortly, um, uh, prepared this uh, Google Earth project that's the underlying visual interactive database for it. 
and it's actually the, is underlying my, my slide here. And we're also very grateful to the National Trust for Scotland for permission to work on their land and for all of their help and collaboration with the, the early stages of this uh, initiative. So what we're really interested in, I suppose, is collaborative performance, because that's what we're doing right here, right now, in this digital Glen. But it's also what has been happening in the Glen for uh, rather over half a billion years. Uh, and so just, just looking at this slide and looking at the collaborative performances here between um, the different sorts of rock and the goats, and you know, there's deer and rabbits and cows and all sorts of things here as well. The, the different trees, the hawthorns, the, the, the spruces, the weather, a lot of weather in Glencoe, and all of the changes in this over the, the, millen the millennia. And so we are trying in our different ways just to follow in this great tradition of collaborative performance using different media. That's in fact my, uh, my son Andrew taking a photosphere. Different media, same sort of collaboration, same sort of performances. And in particular, we're going to be exploring in this collaborative way rocks, mappings, shielings, sounds, stories, and media. I hope my colleagues don't mind me reducing their wonderful contributions to a single word each. But of all of this, they're probably going to disagree with me, but I would say the most dramatic performance of them all was from the rock 420 million years ago. Because Glencoe didn't just erupt, it exploded. These ma series of massive explosions. You know, imagine that the, uh, all of the rock around the volcanic vents being shattered and blown up this huge column of volcanic ash going way up, up into the sky. And then the pyroclastic flows coming hurtling uh, down the, the slopes. And you know, what a performance that was. And of course the performance and the collaboration continues with the moving continents and the changing climate and the, the water and the uplift and everything else, sculpting out this continually changing landscape. And then comes the ice. So up here on Ranach Moor, we, we've got the, the, um, the ice center of Scotland. It's a kilometer thick, 20,000 years ago. And then this glacier comes charging slowly down, if you see what I mean. And it it's, um, gouges out the watershed that used to be there and comes down the glen, on making, you know, um, scooping out the glen. Um, it nibbles away at the feet of the three sisters standing here. That's why they're, they're so cut off and then charges on uh, down to um, Loch from there, dropping glacial erratics and le leaving moraine uh, as it goes. And all of this, of course, um, these ongoing collaborations has make, made a great difference to what it's like to for humans and animals, say, and vegetation to live in the Glen. And it's quite different up here and up here than what it is uh, down here in Glen Lake Amulia that we'll be hearing about from uh, Eddie a little bit later. So the moral of the story, or my new slogan, if you like, is that rocks flow, mountains move. That's something we always need to remember. We think of them as static, as permanent, but no, they're always on the move. And you, you, you can see them um, uh, just in the rocks themselves. This is the pyroclastic flow here. You see these flows and these uh, separate layers, and then the um, the, um, the lava, uh, the more running lava flows out and then it cools in the, these um, lovely polygons. Okay, so flowing rocks, uh, moving mountains. Now, this is of course true for geological time, but what I'm trying to say is that rocks still flow and mountains still move, and this is really important. And it's often actually recognized um, by the people who live there. You can see it in the archeology, span in the place names and the stories that still um, fill this glen. So the place names are full of important rocks and particular shaped mountains. Um, they're, they're, they're all very carefully delineated uh, in the, the names. And of course, the collaborations with other things, the, rock, the goats and the, the, the stags, for example. And rocks carry stories. So Clachvatan, here in the entrance to Glen Lech and Muya, we'll be hearing about that from Eddie. And the slabs. Uh, down here, uh, um, because this is schist and it makes very nice slabs, and you might be hearing more from Eddie uh, about that. And the followers of Fionn Mach Cool, um, when they um, defeated the Vikings, they actually had a geological imprint on this mountain up here, Scorn and Fionn. Okay, so um, there are um, continuing collaborations and stories within these, these rocks themselves. 
but it's not just some um, human association with the rocks because the rocks are doing things okay they're moving they're alive and this is a triachtan uh, being excavated by Derek Alexander for the National Trust of Scotland a couple of years ago and it's, it's a really nice settlement 18th 19th century it was almost certainly there during the, the massacre of 1892 um, but what gets me is all of this stuff here all of this scree this debris has flowed out of these channels being uh, incised in the hard andesite following the, the softer intrusive volcanic dikes there and look at the size of this um, there's another even bigger one flowing out of this canyon here. You can't see most of it. It's behind the tree. Um, but um, uh, that sometimes flow, uh, has flown, has flowed across the A82 running there. And a bit of a study on this bigger one in the 1980s, that there were something like 114 of these debris flow events since the 1840s. Now that's more than one a year. So imagine the sounds of being in the settlement, more on sounds uh, assumed from Lizzie, but this torrential rain just goes on and on, and Benko is good at this. But then imagine right above you, um, you hear the sudden whoosh of this rush of water and the roar of all of the, all of the tumbling rocks. That's another debris flow event, as the geomorphologists would, would call it. So that's part of life and landscape, is these big events. And here's a really big event. This is one of the biggest rock falls um, in the, um, the, the UK. Uh, and what gets me about this and rocks in general is they tell all these different stories, but particularly the story of the massacre. 13th of February in 1892, uh, sorry, in 1692. Um, it's, it's the anniversary of uh, this coming Saturday when government soldiers who'd been billeted with the local McDonald's on government orders rose up first thing in the morning um, and killed as many of the McDonald's as they could. 38 were killed. The rest escaped the best they could up the Glen, say from Achtrayton, up the Glen. And then one place that we know that a lot of them went was um, up the side of the Glen and into this hanging valley where the entrance was totally cut off by this incredible rockfall. There's a huge chunk of Yar Ernoch up here, um, the, the short ridge, one of the three sisters. Um, th this is not 0.6 million tons of rock that, that came down here. You see the people for scale. These, these are the size of houses, some of the, these bigger rocks. And um, it's so cut off the entrance that the fleeing McDonald's, according to one of the stories, could actually block it off with the tree trunk. I also wonder about some of these rocks that tumbled on top of each other. So there's gaps underneath where, of course, you, you can um, hide from soldiers, certainly from the snow, because this all happened during a, a snowstorm. And so this, um, it's a place of refuge for cattle, for people, and something of this is perhaps um, captured in its name, Codagol. Um, and then they could continue off the, the uh, Bialach Jerak um, from behind the photographer there. So that, that, that's one, one um, example of um, rocks flowing, uh, mountains moving, and telling the story of the massacre. There are others, but um, just, just uh, one more. This, this rock is a good traveller. Okay, we're right down um, near Glencoe village. It's called Clach Henrik, um, McHenry Stone, more commonly now Henderson Stone. Um, it rode all the way down the glen on the back of a glacier. This is granite from uh, Rannach Moor, up the, the top of the glen. So it's clearly different. It stands out. It means something. It's got a story, so you need to listen to it. Um, what, uh, what, what's its story? And it features in a lot of these massacre story, stories. You'll be hearing one from, from Kate shortly. Uh, and um, there is, it's one of these warning stories. So the, one of the government soldiers on the 12th of February, the day before, um, was sitting there watching a shinty match with a local boy. And you know he's thinking of what's going to happen in the morning. So he turns, not to the boy, he's not going to give anything away. He turns to the stone and he says, Rock, you look very happy here, but if I were you, I would be up that mountain and away tonight. And uh, the boy, he's got the ears to hear, he can listen to the rock, he can, the rock is the medium for the passing on of this, this information from the, the soldier to the boy, and sure enough, the boy and his families can uh, escape up the hill. But what's interesting is that that little performance there between the soldier, the rock and the boy, there are still these collaborative performances between people and the rock. So if you look just on top there, this is a last, last year when I, went, when, when I was there, on top of the rock, um, there's all of these coins from all over the world that have been offered to the rock. And that there 
is a card celebrating a Henderson, uh, Henderson's Rock, remember, whose ashes were scattered around here. So these performances are very, very important. Um, that rock is still playing a really important and collaborative role with the people of the Glen and, in fact, all over the world. I think that Henderson was from Canada. So rocks tell a story. They play this really Im important role in human society and in the landscape uh, much more widely, in the landscape holistically. And so please, above all, remember, rocks flow, mountains move. But now we need to, we've got our nose in the rock here, we need to zoom up and away and we're going flying. And we have a great pilot to take you around the Glen. And I'm now going to hand over to Megan Casty. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now I'll make sure that hopefully this will all go smoothly. I had to pre-record ahead of time. Um, that okay? Can everyone yeah. see that? Yep, that's it. Good. All right. Uh, here we. Hello, I'm Megan, and today I am pre-recording this just because whenever you try and uh, present something of this nature live, uh, something will inevitably go wrong. So, uh, here we are in our digital Glen of Glencoe. Now, the original aim of creating this Google Earth part of the project um, was to create essentially a sort of desk space assessment uh, that's embedded in the digital landscape, having the archaeological information combined with uh, the place name evidence, some images and stories relating to features in the landscape. Uh, and so we chose Google Earth because um, had to be intuitive, uh, kind of an intuitive interface, had to be easy to use, um, and it had to be collaborative because we had this interdisciplinary team, uh, each have their own specialties and being able to add uh, different types of information uh, to the same document was quite important. Um, and it, it didn't require a whole lot of processing power. This obviously is uh, functioning in the browser um, and it's easy to add points as they kind of come up. So the backbone of this uh, came from data points from Canmore, just kind of an arbitrary area around the Glen. Um, and so that was imported as a KML file and um, had to be added, like all these points had to be added manually, unfortunately, uh, but to develop the color coding and the icon system, it had to kind of go that way anyway. So the names of most of these points and uh, the categories they've been assigned to largely derive from the Canmore information from each entry. Um, as you can see, there are some that have a more ornate sort of icon and might be a bit larger. Uh, and so those ones are the ones that have more information. All of these, almost all of these will have the Canmore record uh, and the categories that have been assigned to the site. Um, but these ones with the larger icons will have the images, um, some from Canmore, some from other sources, and old maps and things. Uh, and some will have comments and uh, stories associated with the place. Uh, and these are all cited. So if we want to explore the uh, landscape, there are a couple ways to do it. So we have um, these the categories that have kind of developed out of uh, what was here. Uh, there's either you can search for a specific site, as we'll see in a minute, uh, because this is part of the web page, web page and searchable, or uh, we have this kind of more structured exploration. Uh, you can look at um, specific uh, categories and see which sites have been assigned to that category, the natural features with cultural significance, um, so something like that. And as I mentioned, it's also quite easy to add points as well. Um, so let's say we have this uh, set of latitude and longitude points for Clach uh, uh which I believe um, Eddie will be discussing in his part of the presentation, and as you can see, quite easy to add to project. So if we want to take a look at a site 
like Austriaxin. And so this is a site that was excavated a few years ago. Um, you can see hey, we've got some old maps, some uh, site plans, uh, things like that. Uh, Michael Givens' photos from when he visited the site while it was being excavated. Um, some images from Canmore as well. And um, you can see that there's more archaeological information here from the site report. And so you can see there's the added benefit of um, the satellite data. And so you can see the more recent uh, debris flows and that could be taken into consideration when thinking about the past landscapes and how that might have sounded or uh, impacted their daily lives. So um, now if we want to continue up the glen a little ways now uh, let's have a look at Bridge of Three Waters. And so this 3D data comes from all these satellite images and different imagery that Google has uh, access to. And so we can kind of get a sense of scale of the features. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little too difficult to get right down in there. Uh, so it's not quite the same as being there, but it's pretty good. And so if we look at Kurigal over here, we can see some rock falls as well. So imagine how that must have sounded in the landscape as well. Now, if we want to come up the glen again, eh, well, this kind of throws into sharp relief that we have multiple sets of satellite imagery here. So the green kind of uh, data set actually comes from 2018 and the uh, less vibrant side comes from 2020. That's a mood. Um, and so now we'll kind of finish up uh, on this thought of uh, storyscapes. And so uh, Neil Moore, I think, will also feature in Lizzie's talk. Uh, but the information we have for Neil Moore is that um, it was key to the escape of some uh, of the families. Uh, and so we can follow their trail from Glencoe itself up across the western shoulder and moving south and around to Glanliach Namuya down here. So while the original purpose of this digital glen was to facilitate uh, interdisciplinary researchers working together on a project uh, while working from home, uh, combining all the information from different sources uh, into one collaborative document, uh, I think this uh, period has kind of highlighted that these digital outputs can take on additional lives in the future, whether it's uh, kind of forming the basis for a community digital mapping project or um, or even just simply something to open on your phone and revisit the connections made in the digital Glen when you're actually physically in the Glen. So uh, thank you. And uh, I believe Eddie is next. First on mute myself first. Yeah. Be smart. yeah. Um so uh, thanks for the introduction there. Um I'm a PhD student in my first year uh, researching, as my title puts it, the relationship between shielding practice and other upland seasonal industries and agricultural practices in post medieval Scotland. Um, so today I'll be talking about how this research will be carried out within the landscape of Glencoe, how it intersects with the work of the Digital, digital group, Glens Group. Um, shielding practice, for those of you who don't know, is the seasonal movement with cattle to upland pastures over the summer months, usually associated, associated with the younger women of the parish, um, and it's a form of transhuman. But in terms of the aims of this research, they, they boil down largely to an attempt to re-evaluate the traditional narratives around shielding landscapes, 
and to reconsider them as part of a complex and seasonally busy network of practices. This approach, uh, realised through a variety of methods, I hope to be able to explore how they might reinterpret these supposedly empty landscapes uh, to challenge elite narratives of wild, empty sublimity and attempt to repopulate these landscapes in the collective imagination. Uh, this will take the form of a practices-based approach, uh, which considers the relationship between activities occurring within these landscapes, which at various points seasonally would have likely produced a far busier network of tasks than the traditional narratives provide for. Uh, these often kind of focus around the liberty the liberating and liminal nature of these kind of isolated landscapes. As part of this challenging of previously dominant discourses imposed upon the upland landscape, I hope to take a scholarly activist approach to these narratives, which have justified clearance and continue to justify elite land ownership patterns today. Um, so the, the methodology for this research takes two parts, really. The first considering the archaeological approaches to the study of this landscape, and the second, which I'll explore later, focusing on evaluating present local community uh, landscape values and attempting to engage in these uh, in discussions around about the past and present busyness of these landscapes. In terms of archaeological works, firstly, archival research, aerial photograph interpretation and LIDAR where available, will be used to identify features and activities occurring within these landscapes. Then walkover survey and test excavation will be carried out to identify and interpret features. And critical phenomenology and embodied approaches will be used to consider factors such as sight lines, routes of movement and auditory ranges as well. Um, I'll be carrying out this research both at Glen uh, Area in Glencoe and that sites within uh, the Mar Lodge estate and the Isle of Canna, all properties of the National Trust for Scotland. In the present, thanks to the surveys of Harden and Wordsworth, and subsequent work by the NTS, we can begin to identify areas of shielding practice within the Glencoe area. Most of this clusters around Glenley Artemuia, a uh, place name with associations with milking activity. Uh, I think it translates, according with Michael's help, uh, to uh, Valley of the Slab, the Milk Town. This is a, a landscape already kind of associated with milking activity and the sort of shielding practices. We also see shielding activity around the eastern edge of the Glen, beyond the Pass of Glencoe, at the mouth of Glen Etive, and the fringes of Rannoch Moor as well. For the purposes of this research, though, I focus mainly on this, the shielding landscape of Glenley Athenamu. Um, within Glenley Athenamu, alongside the movement over the summer months of livestock in the nearby townships, and for that period, the residents of a community comprised of younger women and boys, starting and ending with a great flitting. We also see uh, evidence for a number of activities present alongside those that we direct the shillings, such as milking, herding and cheese making. Within the Glen, we also see extensive evidence of charcoal burning platforms um, and storage huts, whether these are for storing dairy products from the shillings or, or indeed another product um, is kind of unclear at the present, although hopefully excavation might be able to un uh, unfurl and tell that story more. Above the shielding uh, clusters on the slopes of Newmore, uh, we see considerable peat deposits in the form of histosols, umbrasols, and podzols um, as the sort of superficial, superficial uh, geology. Now, these are likely being exploited as a fuel, so fuel source over the summer months uh, for storage and drying till winter. Similarly, on the far slope of Neil Moore in Corrin McCool, um, an illicit whiskey still cited, investigated as well. And recent work on this topic has found that they are quite often associated within shielding landscapes. And perhaps there is some interplay between the, the, the shillings acting perhaps as kind of um, lookouts almost within this practice, or else that the, those staying at the shillings are themselves those that are carrying out this act activity. Um, although traditionally it's kind of associated with um, male figures in the community, this is kind of being challenged in recent years. So, through the planned fieldwork and archival research, uh, this research will explore and interrogate the relationship between these features, and in light of more recent survey practices, uh, reevaluate previous interpretations. Um, as part of this research, through carrying out fieldwork in these landscapes, such as Glenley Athenamu, I'm interested in exploring how the act of fieldwork, uh, survey and excavation in this case, can be repopulating, transforming the landscape with new networks of tasks and embodied experiences. As part of this, I hope to explore some creative engagements with landscape and the rhythms of fieldwork. Uh, this will include hopefully collaborating with Lizzie Robertson, uh, who you'll hear from soon, in producing a series of audio recordings and soundscapes of the rhythms of fieldwork. The second part of my research, I alluded to at the beginning, uh, focuses on the contemporary community landscape values, aims at provoking a reconsideration of shielding landscapes as having a past and present busyness. Engage existing community landscape values, primarily via digital platforms initially. We're organising focus group activities, exploring themes of landscape values, both aesthetic and cultural. Following on from this, walking interviews and community app mapping exercises will be utilised to explore local understandings of the landscape and to record places of significance to the local communities part of an attempt to recognise the busyness and significance of these upland landscapes to their local communities in the present. 
Hopefully from this, it will be possible to produce a digital database and corresponding community map to the Glencoe area and other study landscapes, which will overlap evidences of past busyness with those places of significance to local communities. In consultation with these communities and my principal research stakeholders, the NDS, I hope to produce resource packs used within the existing framework of outdoor education at the Trust. These would use shielding landscapes as a setting to explore aspects of history, biology and geography, tying into the curriculum for excellence, providing interdisciplinary outdoor education resources. In starting out with the community-based research, I started by identifying and observing exi existing digital local community interest groups, particularly those with an interest around heritage or landscape topics. Um, this has already kind of proved to be really interesting in identifying particular sites within this landscape, uh, which the local community attaches significance to, such as the clay study, study and um, This is a large rocky outcrop um, or erratic at the edge of the of mouth of Glen Lerfnamuya. You can see it just in the bottom left there of um, the, the photograph of Glen Lerfnamuya. Um, and it's associated with the activities of the, the Appen murder, and particularly this sort of story that's actually probably derived from Robert Louis C. Stevenson's kidnap um, of Alan Brecht and the, the fictional David Balfour hiding atop this rock while being pursued by the government troops through the Glen. So through this work, both, uh, reviewing and exploring the historical and archaeological narratives and uh, through engagements with local people in the NDS as stakeholders, uh, this research will be used to inform the representation and reinterpretation of these upland landscapes, allowing for a repopulation of the landscapes through interpretation which is accessible and sympathetic to local and tourist audiences. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that my part of the, the research is funded by the Scottish Graduate School for Humanities Doctoral Training Partnership. Um, I'd like to thank Michael, Rachel and uh, Dan Jones for supervising me. Um, I'd also like to thank the National Trust for Scotland uh, archaeology team for their assistance and support in this research. Um, I'll hand on now, it's Lizzie's next, I think. Share my screen. To the very efficiently named WEDSEM PowerPoint that I have created. <laughs> um, grand. So hi everyone, my name is Lizzie and I'm going to talk to you a bit today about the research I'm doing in, <clears throat> that I'm doing in Glencoe. Um, so quite generally, I've always been quite interested in combining my other interests into archaeology. Um, so that's kind of which the past couple of years has kind of been about exploring creativity and sound as a means of um, creating, engaging interpretation for archaeology, um, which, you know, whether this has been through um, hidden, hidden audio tours for um, heritage um, or uh, creating digital experiences for, um, of heritage with interactive sound. Um, but in my current research, um, I'm really wanting to explore ways in which contemporary interventions can promote more nuanced interpretations and interactions of memorialized pasts and highlight new aspects and reflections of Highland life that do not rely on overplayed and romanticized stereotypes. Glencoe, of course, is perfect example of this, um, with ground, wild and rugged slopes, and of course I put these in inverted commas, um, and a past associated with Highlanders, clans and massacre, it has of course been subject to many romantic notions and projected ideas about Highlandism. And whilst these uh, associations are still bound up in the cultural notions of Glencoe, there is more to the landscape than this. When you stand in Glencoe today and um, hear the sounds from the A82, um, you might somewhat kind of wish for the peace and tranquility that the Romantics once promised us and feel somewhat that your, your experience is inauthentic. Um, but as you've seen from Michael, Megan and Eddie that's come before me, this Glen was brimming with activity. Um, both human and non-human. So maybe the decibels produced by the various Arctic lorries, coach tours and camper vans are actually closer in levels to the soundscapes that 
local communities were familiar with in the 17th century or earlier. Uh, this desire for authenticity when it comes to archaeological interpretation is, of course, deeply flawed, um, which is why, in my approach, I'm embracing creativity and seeking to evoke past, present and future realities of this iconic place. Um, and well, just for reference, this is a very chaotic um, mind map of where my, my planning has come so far, but um, I think I was going to click onto that slide earlier, but I will click on to immersive technologies. Um, yeah, this leads me to immersive technologies, which broadly speaking includes virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. With this technology becoming more and more available at a consumer level, it's enjoyed renewed interest in the past decades um, and has become a popular method for various museums and heritage institutions to adopt um, and introduce a digital layer to their site interpretation or um, general audience engagement. Um, with some exceptions, the, the focus can be primarily on visual components. Um, immersive interactive soundscapes as a means of engaging audiences with heritage um, I would argue are underexplored and have exciting potential for landscape based experiences. So in a way, what I propose to do is sort of an augmented reality in that I'm augmenting the audience's physical experience and perceptions of landscape with layers of sound. Uh, the visual element of their reality is already present in a way in that they're standing in the middle of Glencoe, um, perhaps next to some ruined building or on the edge of where an excavation trench once was. Um, but by introducing sounds of the past activities, stories and interactions that happened in this landscape, it kind of starts to create an interesting dichotomy between what one can hear but can no longer see which I think is why it's quite good for archaeology, which often can be hidden under the ground. Um, with spatialized elements and digital acoustics, a turf house could be recre recreated digitally um, and acoustically, um, and an audience could wander around inside through sound whilst being outside in sunny Glencoe, which probably it's more likely going to be rainy Glinko. Um, so my approach to my work, I think, can be roughly divided into its four categories. Um, first of all, it's about recollecting the sounds of the landscape, delving into the audio archives such as Mbali and Toparan Dulcis and engaging with the rich collections of local Gaelic speaking folk that are telling stories about landscapes, um, which you'll hear just after me um, by Kate, um, and um, maybe about traditional farming processes such as threshing, which I've got a picture of um, a couple of people threshing here with a, with a flail, um, using quern stones or working songs used when, you know, walking the, walking the cloth or, um, and um, these often have a very strong rhythmical element to them, almost kind of like quite industrial and mechanical, which is quite sort of in contrast to the sort of notions that we have about these traditional farming techniques. But I think sound wise, this sort of repetitive pounding notion does sort of sound kind of similar. And I think this kind of provides me with quite a lot of inspiration when considering the final composition. Um, old field recordings of, of birds and other environmental sounds as well, I think, that were kind of were kind of taken mid 20th century when there was a real push for sort of thinking about preserving soundscapes and stuff like that. Combine this with oral histories, I think there's a cool sort of sonic continuum kind of created in which by placing the sounds in modern contexts, this could achieve quite an interesting sort of contrasting effect. Um, 
my second category is this is me collecting sounds by the Cock and O'Burn, um, but because I haven't been lucky enough to do some field work in, in Glencoe yet. So um, this will be me, but um, yeah, there's the process of collecting noises in the soundscape, in the landscape, which is kind of about my own field work practice, um, which creativity inevitably already begins to feed into this when I have to make decisions about what I want to record, you know, sounds of nature, of people, of activities such as excavations or building of reconstructed turf houses. This raises questions about authenticity and is there an authenticity to sounds I record because they happened in Glencoe or is it just as authentic to use sounds that sound similar to things that happened in the past or weren't taken in Glencoe? Um, then, of course, there is the element of creation and experimentation with soundscapes. Um, this is, of course, as an ongoing practice that, you know, I'm already kind of feeding into in the two previous categories. Um, and it's within this mode of production that consideration of the sorts of stories that I want to tell audiences begin to fully form and how I want to affect them emotionally and how this can be told through the material that I've collected. Um, thinking through ways to try and communicate some abstract concepts, uh, such as geology and rock formations through sound, which I think is something quite important too, because often in the Gaelic names, that's you know really highlighted, such as Mialmore and some of the other rocky outcrops. And I'm conscious of time and needing to move on. So I'll just kind of quickly sort of say that that you know, throughout this process, it's really important to me that it's it's creative, and I kind of want to kind of approach it in quite a sort of um, non-traditional way. And um, yes, it's an ongoing process basically. But I will pass on to um, Kate, who um, is going to um, tell some stories, which I think will kind of feed on well from this. So thank you very much. Ich kische über Achus Hugh. 
se gan cloinigi porst ir a hain ir a fib agus gan cloinigi an ravag a vaun as unish na brieran nish ha hir gra it said that some of the government troops awaited their orders with some dread and desperation for the people they had got to know over the course of a fortnight or so and whether the two soldiers in the story acted together or alone to save the people they did is not clear but their respective acts of mercy are something of a salve in the wound of the Glencoe massacre Jewish hijit Jewish hijit Dachinus two soldiers two acts of mercy Daru de Rainyad er son kuj jenadinya havlig iravadinchen He knew that Johans Johans it was very likely that somebody in the settlement around him would have the close hue the close hue that is the ability to understand the nature of the warning in a pibroch chun without the words to communicate it orstu a khud glan vive na mach nach ro ignasajer and dunya agobio any man any boy who would become a man a mesk nandalwach was to be put to the sword and so if our man could save anybody he would i guess mershan right now mach eighty an hour before the fateful hour he went up to clachyonrig and into the wind so that it would surely carry it he played the pibroch you've just heard and she heard it she had the close cue i guess rain isha mach elena valoch na hachlish she escaped with her baby boy in one oxter and in the other oxter a kulan a puppy i guess galisha so as alpen the ye some small miles in the snow before she sat down by the rochchan and a shin and i don't know if it was her intention to wait there long by alpen the ye ach van sajid and and dahud remorse and dalach i guess we should have done the nya hour at fala i guess of a gal fastig on a shin it wasn't long before two figures appeared at alpen the ye on a shin eshin of an agromenach sub lieutenant to baun and he reached the bridge at achigmengon and saw the woman and her young son plainly a dark sodden bruised bundle against the white and all the will in this world fast leaving them and he turned to our second soldier and he gave him orders he said haji shanashin bornach aksa misminach nach kalach ke hech ke ijet ach gilwein pasche baloch ach valuse agis nach e kuruaska and so our second soldier climbed down and he prepared himself for his orders that he was to kill the baby and leave the woman to die achunigam bornache and she begged him and she said nach smunichu avina dil won beg nach savalu mo fastje and the soldier realized instantly that he wouldn't be able to do it so kajaina a hogach wife 
and he thrust his sword instead into the body of the puppy. Agaskala and Shen lay fool at a chlayu. Erash, Agaskani can say it, and the rainua. The rainua and the churu ass, don't you like Hanil Megal Lynching? Famous grow is Saravachal and Shen. And the soldier said, I did kill the wee boy. See, see, look. You can see the blood on my sword. I killed him. Ha homagang fala anishit, fagishini. And so he saved the pair of them. Nish blia nichin and jishin. Blia nichin and jishin, I guess. When that soldier was an old man, he was travelling up through Appen. And he stopped at an inn. Gave drama, no gave page. He struck up a conversation with the man behind the bar. I don't know if they had bars back then, but the the innkeeper anyway. <laughs> and as the soldier spoke to the innkeeper, the younger man, he realised how much he was enjoying the conversation, how much he respected that younger man. And so something provoked him to to tell him that he'd been involved in most of the line. I guess Marshin a guy jike. Groyer of Imar first yet, Agus Groyer Dinya Hud Kabas, but that the greatest atrocity he had committed was to leave them to die on the beach in, in the glens surrounding. And he said to the young man, I will be living in hell for the rest of my days for that. But I did one thing that I am proud of. I saved one boy, and whether he survived or not, I'm not sure, but he did not meet his end at the point of a sword, and and I have found some peace with myself because of that. And the young man smiled, and he said, be at peace. Von ismishe ivaloch, ahavalu, iravad because I'm the wee boy that you saved. Okay, and Gareth. Thank you. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of you for providing so much context for my presentation, but that's quite an act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, right, bear with me. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so... Um, as an archaeologist, my specialism and research focuses on digital storytelling. Um, and this work can be divided, as far as I'm concerned, into two discrete, albeit related areas. The first of these is the identification and use of new technologies, um, so focusing specifically on the technology. But the second and equally important part of my research in this area is um, consideration of how we tell stories using these technologies and how um, different approaches to storytelling can emerge when we as archeologists or historians or whoever we are um, interact with these technologies and use these uh, technologies to tell stories. This presentation is gonna focus on the latter of these two areas and on how uh, under strange and difficult circumstances of life that we've all lived through in 2020, my attitudes to digital media and their place within the archeological process have shifted. As I talk, I'm gonna play a short film made during this period and it's called Irhen uh, Og, and this is its first public showing outside of the uh, university. So I hope you like it. I'm gonna press play now and then I'm going to talk over the top. So I hope that's not too distracting. Um, so two things um, which you should know um, about early 2020 um, are that we were uh, working 
at this point, as Michael mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, on early prototypes, uh, working with the National Trust for Scotland to develop games and interactive experiences which would allow an exploration of Glencoe and Glenshiel based on a range of audio and video captured on site. But fate intervened and we weren't able to capture very much video and audio. Um, during this same period, just before lockdown hit, uh, I moved to Helensborough. So um, as a result, uh, filming of this uh, content, which was to be uh, incorporated into a game, shifted, relocated to Helensborough so that the experimental work continued prior to us being able to revisit Glencoe under better circumstances which hopefully will be soon. Um, during this time, my family began their exploration of our new home, uh, which involved lots of uh, pushing of buggies designed for West End pavements up rough farm tracks and endless emptying of children's wellies as we set off to find various shipwrecks and fish years, which will feature in this film. As we explored, I began to realize the value of film, not just as a means of documenting archeology, span but as a mediator allowing exploration of the landscape and the discovery of archaeology within it. As we became intensely familiar with our surroundings, I began to observe and document the presence of archaeology within the landscape and to notice the ways in which archaeology and natural processes were entangled, often serving to distort or highlight different temporalities and rates of change which sometimes seem to shudder uh, rather than move smoothly as we're used to seeing the Neolithic stone sliding glacially into the burn, an encounter with a stray boat on a beach which was graffitied with a message of ironic bl or blind hope before being broken apart and smashed on the rocks days later. As we came to know places as a family, the archaeological and the personal seemed to collapse into each other in interesting and unexpected ways. And through a process of filming and editing, I tried to capture, explore, and represent these entanglements. From Ardmore Point, a small peninsula in the Clyde, you can see clearly the wreck of the MV Captionis, a merchant vessel which slipped its moorings in a storm in the late 1970s and capsized. Nobody was killed, but the ship created an artificial island, always visible from where we live part submerged. The ship is a powerful reminder to me of the underwater world, of the glens and canyons of the lower Clyde to which so much has been lost. Talking to my mum about this during a brief, her brief visit between lockdowns, she told me, well, back in the late 19th century, your great, 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 I believe, maybe more greats, I'm not sure, uncle went down on his ship just off of clock points and that was called the Europa. Even as an outsider, just starting to put down roots, the making of the film quickly took me down pathways, literal and metaphorical, on which I discovered and developed profound links to place. I thought of my family over generations, sailing in and out of these waters and taking their Clyde built paddle steamers to war. And I thought of childhood stories of Taliesin and the fording of the Clyde and Charles Causley uh, younger than I am now, writing the poem Convoy, and of eyes staring through the freezing sea glass and iron winds clanging around ice caps as the five pointed dog star burns over the silent sea. As we wandered, we found traces of people everywhere. The woodland behind our house has provided us with the wherewithal to start our own museum of tenants' bottles through the ages. And even the remotest beach has traces of ancient and modern fishing and fires. It almost felt at times like this small town was overcrowded with these people from through the ages. They became inescapable, as though 2020 was a period during which the lines between life and death, the past and the present, possessions and artifacts became troublingly faint. In short, the film allowed me very unexpectedly to capture and through editing, crystallize and articulate a connection to place which I hadn't thought possible. 
And it's this really, the DIY approach to filmmaking, the use of filmmaking as a tool with which to converse with landscape in the past, which I'd like to develop further as we take our work from uh, Helensborough and Glasgow and the places where we are uh, confined to quarters at present and move into Glencoe. And I'd like to think as we start to work with the people of Glencoe, um, diverse and various people of Glencoe representing uh, a great deal of difference that we'll uncover new landscapes, new points of view and new ways of seeing space and place and archeology span and time, which we hadn't considered before. Um, and so this has been a very useful uh, exercise, albeit superficially unrelated to Glencoe. And I think it's this spirit which runs through all of our presentations today. Different approaches, different places and different periods and each differently reflect, refracting the interplay between archeology span and place and a presence and situatedness of the archeologist, the artist and the storyteller within these landscapes, be they Glencoe or for me, places closer to home. I run out of things to say, but there's another few minutes of the film, so I'm just gonna leave it to play. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's us, I think. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Gareth. Uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for six wonderful short presentations, uh, really evoking a broad range of um, aspects of the, the Glencoe story um, and very very powerful um, contributions. So thank thanks very much. Uh, I, I can't see everyone on the screen, so if, if anyone has a has a question that they want to ask, could they indicate on the chat box? And I'm happy to read your question out, but also um, I can ask you to actually speak if you want to do that as well. So, uh, has anyone got any questions that they want to ask to any ask to any of our speakers? Okay, so there's a question from Ian. If you want to go ahead and turn yourself on. <laughs> you might want to rephrase that for the next person. Um, yeah, a question for Edward. It was about, it, it was just in passing. He, did I hear him correctly? He said something about uh, charcoal when he was up at the Shieldings. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, a number of uh, charcoal burning platforms um, identified from the, the, the previous survey. Um, Certainly across the sort of glen sides, and there are a number of kind of small woodland pockets down by the the belt itself, um, which would seem to kind of correlate with that. They they appear on the older maps as well. Um, I think from the, the record of the, the the previous survey, they they noted that uh, one or two of them had charcoal deposits eroding out of the side of them, which I think kind of largely prompted that uh, interpretation. And do you know what which wood they were using for charcoal? Um, I've, I've not quite managed to dive into the, the kind of documentary yet. Um, certainly in the first, it's the first edition of the OS, and there's, a, there's an area of woodland enclosed by an embankment slightly further up the glen, 
which would perhaps seem a fairly promising starter point to look at, certainly. Um, but I've not really got anything more than that, I'm afraid. Presumably this is for the local blacksmith. Um, yeah, I would, I would have thought so for those sorts of, um, yeah, largely for the blacksmiths, perhaps um, potentially for other sort of related activities, perhaps um, helping or the, the later points that the kelp industry down by the coast um, may well have had some use for it. But yeah, I would have imagined that the blacksmiths would have been the primary users probably. Um, yeah. Thanks. Can I just kind of come in there? Um, our, our colleague, Anus McConnick, has done some very interesting documentary research um, and has found a lot of evidence for timber production in the late medieval periods and onwards. And some of the place names talk about certainly pines and alders where in places where there's absolutely nothing now. So I, I think the, the whole business of you know, um, timber uh, for the forest uh, industries and so on would be fascinating to follow up. Thanks, and I think there's a contribution in the chat related to that as well. Um, Nikki, you had a sort of supplemental question about fuel, if you want to say it. Uh, um, it, was more a, it was more a question of whether they, I wonder if they could be burning peat rather than wood, although I can't think of a single example of peat being used for charcoal production, but I guess in theory it should be possible. Um, but if, if they were already uh, managing woodland resources anyway, then I guess they could be getting it from elsewhere. Um, but I just wondered since... Um, peat. I don't know what the peat deposits are like up there, but um, it's a fairly common type of thing to, to burn. Mm. It might be worth thinking about anyway, if you look at the charcoal, but it should be fairly obvious from the charcoal itself, whether it is what exactly it is. Well, that's, that's definitely an interesting point. Um, and yeah, it would be interesting to look at kind of the position of the charcoal coming from them, certainly, um, if, the, if the opportunity arose. Yeah, um, I mean, oh, yeah, there are obviously, there's there's quite large uh, peat deposits uphill, um, particularly on the kind of upper platform um, uh, and, and sort of higher slopes of Mealmore. Um, potentially there's a source for it there. And certainly some of the, um, the sort of features that are marked as shillings on the lower slopes, um, particularly on the, those on the, the, the kind of valley floor part um, of Glenerthmuye, make quite unconvincing shillings really in terms of their their, their kind of size and um, would, would suggest in my mind probably more likely to be a kind of dry stone storage hut perhaps for uh, similar to those kind of found on St Kilda and the Outer Hebrides more rather than a kind of or potentially a kind of uh, a more temporary shilling hut but, but certainly they're kind of strangely scaled um, for considering any particular length of habitation. There's, there's some quite useful comments about um, charcoal production and peat and so on in the chat boxes just now from uh, David, Ryan and Heather. So thanks very much for um, adding that. Um, I wanted to ask the team, um, I guess, and Lizzie mentioned mentioned this in particular about, you know, not being able to get up there to do any recording. What what effect has, has, has the, the pandemic had on your kind of, on your, your the work you've been doing so far? And what are you looking forward to being able to do when travel restrictions are, are lifted at some point later in the year? I mean, I for, answers, but... I'll, I'll have a go. Um, yeah, I mean, I managed to get one field trip in um, right in October. Um, but really it's, it's kind of, it has kind of, I guess, made, had, to kind of make me reconfigure my creative practice in terms of recording. And I guess kind of question like authenticity, I kind of mentioned it in my talk, but like, does it, is it really important? I mean, it could be really important that I take recordings from Glencoe itself, but I guess it's a, it's about the sort of communication and the, the emotions that I want to convey. So maybe certain recordings can be taken from my turf here in, in Glasgow, um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting up to to the Highlands. I think I'd say myself, even though um, even though I live in the area, 
my involvement in the digital glen has been digital uh, up until now. Apart from apart from the cracking twigs, the cracking twigs were from Glencoe, <laughs> and so was the burn. <laughs> but everything else. Um, but it'll be great. It'll be great when you can you can all come up and um, we'll get a proper wee wander. Yeah. Um, Michael, are you going to say something? Okay, sure. Um, obviously, I'm really, really looking forward to uh, getting up to Glencoe again. But I have learned so much just from engaging with the, the digital Glen, uh, you know, geology textbooks uh, and that sort of thing. To some extent, it's just um, you know, desktop work. But particularly when you're able to talk to people and you know, share stories and um, be creative. So, for example, I've already seen um, uh, Gareth's film and found that hugely um, stimulating and thought provoking just in terms of how I look at landscape myself. So I started to do try and do the same thing on Cochno Hill, which is fairly local, but unfortunately it's not quite local enough anymore. So I'm just developing my eye as I walk along the canal by, by the house every, every day. So, um, and, you know, thinking about new ways of recording and some um, new media, new ways of engage, engaging me with the landscape and engaging others with the landscape. So we would never have done this set of presentations today um, had it not been for our development of digital media because of lockdown. Yeah, there's really, really interesting dynamics around the pandemic and how it's, it's sort of in some ways it's stopping us doing things that we used to do in the past but some, you know that's not always a bad thing and it's creating new forms of practice and you know and it's really interesting to see how you've been gradually kind of reshaping what you've been doing and responding to the, the current set of circumstances and it's I think it's involved you know new people coming onto the team and different ways of doing things so that's all quite exciting really. I think um, there's a question <clears throat> from uh, Heidi I'm not quite sure Heidi do you want to ask the question or do you want me to read it out? Um, I can ask it if that's excellent yeah on you go um I, I put it there in the chat but i guess it's for megan um and it's essentially a practical question and you probably might not be able to answer it because of the pandemic but how are you handling if you're using this kind of digital glen with the fact that people might want to then go to these places and how google earth doesn't necessarily provide the best access routes for kind of how to get if you plotted a bunch of places that that isn't necessarily how one gets there um and this is a selfish question because i'm doing this as well <laughs> yeah no I, was, I mean the initial uh purpose for it wasn't necessarily for you know i mean this uh, a point about the pandemic um i wouldn't have been on the project i don't think if it hadn't been for the pandemic we had to reach out for those uh, digital kind of application. So uh, at the moment, it's just more of a, a collection of information uh, useful for uh, the people working on the project. But um, yeah, uh, personally, I haven't been out there, so I don't necessarily know how the pathways and things are. Although theoretically, um, unfortunately, Google Earth is kind of in this like weird, they're working on it kind of transitory kind of thing. Um, but ideally, I mean, you could take like a walking map like a, a hill walkers kind of map and like yeah. add it to the place or something just as like a snapshot not ideal but um that's kind of the best workaround for right now um but yeah so oh, i was just wondering if you had solved that problem for me no sorry <laughs> <laughs> i haven't had a chance to go up either so <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> anyone else got any um, questions Gareth had a comment in our, our last um, our, our last discussion just about the uh, there about the effect of the pandemic on our work. Oh, sorry, sorry, Gareth. Oh, that's all right. No, it's just uh, it's uh, it's really difficult with all of these little boxes. Isn't it? I was just gonna I was just gonna really um, uh, sort of second what what you said at the end, really, Kenny, which was that I think. Um, the way that I work and think about what I do has completely changed. And at the beginning of my little presentation now, I was saying that there are, I sort of see there as being two components to my work. And one is the kind of a 
looking for technological opportunities to try new things and experiment and uh, see how uh, we can use technologies in a sort of archaeological or cultural heritage setting. And to be honest, that's always taken, uh, it's always been in the foreground because it's, um, it's quite easy to sort of respond to new technology as it emerges and to try things out and to sort of uh, be out in the field experimenting with this stuff. And the part of my work that I've always wanted to develop but not really had the time to has been uh, actually developing my own uh, creative practice and thinking about the uh, impact that technologies like this can actually have on how we make things and how we um, collaborate in making things and so I've seen a great example of that here today I think and um, I think all of that kind of uh, slower, <laughs> um, slower sort of uh, more um, reflective practice has been able to come to the fore a lot more in my work and I, um, I'd, I'd love to know if that's true for everyone else but it's certainly been the case for me that I've sort of been forced to work locally and forced to work with the technology I have access to and uh, it's created a completely different dynamic. Gareth and sorry I, I, I cut you off earlier on there. Okay I've got a question for um, the team from an audience member who wishes to remain anonymous. <laughs> um, would, would anyone like to comment or discuss the fact that CLAC and RUIG has been considered and rejected for designation three times by HES? Will any of the work help, any of your work help build the case for its significance and does anyone think it should be designated or does it matter? This slightly depends on us knowing what Clack and Ruig is. Um, I don't know if any of the other five do. It doesn't ring a bell with me, but I'd be, we'd be very interested to hear more about it. Do you mean Clack and the Henderson Stone? Ah. It could well be my terrible pronunciation. Yes, <laughs> Clack, E N R U I G. The Henderson Stone, I'm saying. Right. Yeah, back. sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you may can mention that, Michael. Yes. Um, um, I, I just argued that it's got you know, really important cultural associations. I wasn't aware of that particular issue. Um, and um, I, I think we should certainly look into that. I'll make a note of it right now, in fact. I think there's definitely a case to be made for those, those I mean, it is an obvious one for me because it's so prominent in the oral tradition, but um, I've read and heard about a lot of sites that are very important to local heritage and um, connecting older, connecting surrounding, so, uh, surrounding oral histories in that area. And um, um, yeah, if they're not put in the map or if they're not, if attention isn't brought to them in, in the, in some way, then they can end up just being just being wiped out. Really, um, what's the what's the site in Sky connected to Saint Morua? I don't remember exactly, but there they were. The local community was was um, there was something on Facebook that they put up about that because uh, um, because yeah, that site had been destroyed or damaged. Um, so hopefully, something like. A project like this could work towards bringing attention um, to Clackyonig, but I wasn't aware of that myself either, that that was happening. So, On a slightly sort of more general note, I think the, the, the range of uh, presentations we've had here have shown so many different ways of representing the past and telling stories about the past. And I think one of the things that we're all very interested in is how um, different forms of evidence can be brought to bear on telling stories about the past and the stories that perhaps archaeologists haven't been or haven't told very much before so drawing upon oral histories drawing upon conventional histories drawing upon archaeology and experiences of landscape and I think by bringing all of those things together and telling those stories which draw upon all of those sources it becomes increasingly clear that um, objects which may to some appear to have very little intrinsic value are in fact extremely important when you take them within this broader uh, cultural and historical context. So I, I sincerely hope that as a sort of broader impact of our work, specifically in time, we can 
make some of those links which have been perhaps a bit more ephemeral in the past a lot more solid and a lot more um substantial and i think maybe also the the case of the the, the tinker's heart is a is maybe a, a kind of a parallel to to think about in terms of a of a place of cultural significance that hes took a long time to be persuaded to recognize um so that's maybe maybe some kind of some parallels there that are worth exploring. Oh, there's lots in the chat just now. Um, okay, right. So there's been lots of positive comments and praise in the chat. So hopefully the speakers are all reading that. Um, so Stephen Harrison has um, got a question that you'd like to ask. Hopefully the, uh, the, the, the it, 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 they can read it as well and get advanced warning. It's it's, it's quite a vague question, but it's, it's really about the fact that Glencoe is one of those locations that in the popular imagination, at least, is associated with a single event, that is to say the, the massacre. And as you've been forming the, the, the Digital Glens project, you're obviously aware of that. And you think an aspect of the project is in some way to broaden the narrative beyond that and show the variety of kind of lived experience in the Glen or alternatively, is it, do you think it's so dominant in the popular imagination that as part of the narrative you're building, you kind of have to start there anyway? Um, or is it just so important it should form the focus of any um, study anyway? So it's a very vague question or, or comment, but I just wondered how you felt about it. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, but um, I've, I've got some ideas. Um, well for, for my part anyway I, I kind of I do really like um the idea of tackling this sort of overt sort of well I kind of used the word memorialization and I feel like that Glencoe definitely has been has had that happen to them um to, to the landscape um and I kind of feel like it, it I would like to deconstruct the sort of relationship this has with nationalism generally today and and in in the past, um, well, especially with with the sorts of um, uh, the the artistic movements and you know romanticists like kind of applying these sorts of notions to it. And I I like I would I would like to address these concepts, but equally by putting emphasis on these traditional uh, local practices, kind of seeking to sort of deconstruct um, and sort of kind of complexify this sort of um, the, the stories that were going on there. That, that was quite a general response, but I do want to tackle it is what I was trying to say. Just kind of on from what Lizzie was saying there. Yeah, I'm really kind of interested in how that, that that kind of representation of the Glen as kind of as as Lizzie kind of put it, the moralization of it is kind of using like a static identity for that, that landscape as kind of one that is um it ties into quite a lot of the kind of common tropes of Highlandism and um that sort of uh, romanticism as well that we, we kind of see across it uh, the Highlands. Um and kind of this is kind of almost and it's kind of projected as being kind of empty and inhospitable and and uh, it kind of has similar connotations, perhaps, to those that are kind of used on um, uh, battlefield sites as well, such as Culloden and kind of representing these landscapes as kind of very static and dead and nothing should really be done to them afterwards. Um, they're, they're kind of, kind of good almost as places that are kind of shouldn't be altered or changed or much afterwards as a kind of result of that. Um, I quite like through the, the, the process of the research to try and show that actually this, this landscape is kind of viewed as static and it's kind of history almost is kind of in the end with the, um, this one kind of tragic event. Um, actually kind of continues on and the, the, there are kind of personal histories and local histories and attaching significance to place that occurs well after that um, and which is kind of unrelated to that as well. I'm particularly kind of interested in um, some of the stories around kind of the, the quarry site on the Palatalish um, and uh, some of the kind of landscape engagements around that perhaps as well around kind of the, the Second World War and placements were put in within the Glen. Um, there's the, the kind of machine gun post at the, the pass of Glencoe. And uh, features such as these as well, which are kind of modern interactions in that landscape, are, are kind of unrelated really to that, that kind of overwhelming narrative that kind of crashes down uh, every time the subject's really mentioned. 
I'm, I'm sort of very aware, of, I'm, I'm deviating slightly from the original question here, but I think one of the things that's uh, really um, integral to certainly my work, and I don't want to assume other people, but I think I read this in other people's work, is sort of a moving beyond um, the picturesque idea of landscape and the sort of romantic idea of landscape and towards something which actually sort of I, I reflects a whole range of experiences. I, I'm going to put the word out there and say more authentically, which I know is a very sort of unhelpful term to use because what does that even mean? But I think looking at how different people, and this is sort of what I really want to try, is talking to different people, seeing how different people experience landscape and getting different people to actually make things in response to landscape so that we can get different views onto landscape from different people. And I think that's absolutely key because I think the kind of uh, the focus on the massacre, I mean, it's, it's an enormous cultural presence regardless of how you look at it I'm sure but I think one of the reasons it comes to such prominence is because it's one of the only things that people who aren't intimately familiar with this landscape know about the landscape and it's certainly been it's been continually reinforced through media which very often have little to do with Glencoe in any substantive way they're produced by people who are from outside they're produced by people perhaps with very little reference to the landscape itself and so I think looking more closely and more tightly at um, experiences of place, I think will reveal interesting things beyond that and beyond the picturesque ideas of Glencoe that we're also familiar with, I hope. Thanks, Gareth. Um, so I think that um, it's almost half past five, so I think we've run out of time, but thank you everyone who um, asked questions and also interacted with a very lively chat um, area th this evening and also um, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed anything out when I was trying to ke keep up with that uh, and also I'd like to thank once again our six speakers this evening for sharing some really creative and fascinating and, and emotional insights into um, what's a, a really fantastic project and I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops in the coming years. Just, just to note that um, our um, seminar next Wednesday at four o'clock is uh, uh, the next step in the epic um, celebration of Ewan Campbell, um, the, who the, the, the form and fabric of early medieval Britain series. And we've got two speakers, two great speakers next Wednesday. We've got um, Sharon Webb, who's going to talk about Comartin, a museum in the making. And Neil Sharples is going to be talking about um, when did the Outer Hebrides become Gallic and Scottish? So I expect that'll be another stimulating session and another chance to embarrass Ewan, which is always, always welcomed. So um, at that point, uh, we'll finish up. And thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. Thanks to our speakers and hopefully see you all again next Wednesday. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, very much. Bye. Thanks. 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 Thank you.